Hello everyone, welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we resume our study right where we left off, which would be verse 16. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 16. And in case you're not too familiar with the books in the Old Testament, we have Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. So, I would encourage you to find your Bible if you are able so you can follow along verse by verse and uh, study it together. And while you're looking for your Bible and turning to Ecclesiastes, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And uh, the Scripture Verse by Verse website really exists for one reason, and that's to promote the Bible, to teach the Bible verse by verse, which is something that I've been doing for 30 years. And it's all archived there at thebibleversebyverse.com. So you can go to the Bible, whatever book you want to study. I always encourage, if you're a first-time visitor, go to the book of Genesis, click on chapter 1, and begin in the beginning. And study the entire Bible with me, verse by verse, using my audio Bible messages. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. So with that, let's begin our study In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 16, Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Bible says, And this also is a great evil, that just as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who has labored for the wind, All his days also he eats in darkness, and he has much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. Now, again, if you are joining us for the first time, this book is written by Solomon, and it is written from the perspective of a man who has everything basically that he wants, but he doesn't have God. And it's a record of his futile attempts to try to find satisfaction apart from God in your life, apart from Jesus. And so here in verses 16 and 17, what he is saying is that wealth causes a lot of worry for some people. They worry about getting it, and they worry about keeping it if they do get it. And they really are a pitiful people. Because they worry about losing the wealth that we've already seen and that many of you have probably experienced doesn't satisfy them in the first place. How meaningless is that? You're worrying about losing something that doesn't satisfy you in the first place? That doesn't even make sense. Verse 18, Behold that which I have seen, It is good and fitting for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he takes under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him. For this is his lot. Pretty simple. Work hard, earn what you can, enjoy what you can, and don't worry about losing it. Verse 19. Every man also to whom God has given riches and wealth and has given him power to eat of it, and to accept his lot, and to rejoice in his labor, this is a gift of God. No matter how much you have, it is a gift from God. Whatever you have, and whatever ability you have to enjoy it, are both gifts from God. That's the way wealth and everything that we have should be viewed. Just keep it simple. Don't hoard it. Thank God for it. Put God before it, and you'll be happy. Verse 20. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Trust God. Again, put him first. Enjoy what he gives you. Work hard. And you're not going to have time to worry about the things that you cannot control. Let's go into chapter 6. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. Another bad thing. Another thing 
about life that is evil. And he's had a whole list of things. Well, what is it? Well, look at verse 2. A man to whom God has given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wants nothing for his soul of all that he desires. Yet God gives him not power to eat of it, but a stranger eats it. This is vanity, and it is an evil affliction. Some people have everything that they ever wanted, that they ever dreamed of having, but they don't enjoy it, maybe because they're too sick, maybe because they worry about losing it. There may be a lot of reasons, but it's more evidence that things are not what they should be in this world that sin has damaged. Because if you're living life apart from God, then you may have everything that you have ever dreamed of having, but it's not going to satisfy you. Verse 3, if a man begets a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many and his soul is not filled with good and also that he has no burial, I say that a stillborn birth is better than he. Wow. From the viewpoint of one who doesn't believe in God, or maybe somebody who claims to believe in God, but really doesn't include him in his life, no life at all is preferred over a bad life. So I guess if you think eternal extinction is your end, because you don't believe in God. Or obviously, if you're not living for God and he's not the most important thing in your life, he's not involved in any area of your life, then practically speaking, you are believing that extern eternal extension, extinction, I'm sorry, is your end. And if that's the case, then I guess you're better off never being born at all. I mean, if it's just going to end... And if your life is meaningless, because it will be apart from God, no matter what else you have, you're better off not being bored, born at all, than taking the long, frustrating road through an un unhappy life to that eternal extinction that you believe you're going to receive. What's the point of living and being miserable? You might as well never be born at all. That's what he's saying. Well, what a pitiful way to look at things. And yet, when you stop and think about it, it is the logical attitude of those who exclude God from their life. You exclude God from your life, you are, you are believing that you are going to face eternal extinction. I mean, you must believe that or else you would live for God. You, you'd be afraid uh, to not live for God because you would believe that you were accountable to him. So if you have no fear of God, you have no relationship with God, your life is going to be meaningless because like it or not, you are a spiritual being, being who is not satisfied with material things. And your life is meaningless and it's going to be full of sadness and it's going to be full of frustration. And what's the point? And that's what he's saying. What's the point? Better off not being born at all. Verse 4. For he comes in with vanity and departs in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. And here's the logical reasoning of a person who either doesn't believe in God or doesn't include him in their everyday life. And it's pretty sad. You're born with nothing. What you do in your life is meaningless in the end. And your future is nothing because you think you cease to exist. What in the world is that? No wonder so many of the people who believe that kind of stuff, no matter how much they have, get hammered, do drugs, or do something else to divert attention away from reality. I guess I would too. Verse 5. Moreover, he has not seen the sun, nor known anything. This one has more rest than the other. So, in other words, a person who has never been born, he's never seen the sun, 
He might miss out on a few good times. But all the misery he will avoid will make up for it, so you're better off not being born. See, the, the fatalistic attitude of somebody who exclude, excludes God from their life, you are miserable if you do that. I don't care who you are or what you say, you are miserable because it's not natural and it's not normal. And you can put a fake smile on your face and you can act like Mr. Sophistication, Mr. Cool, Mr. Mr. I'm too sophisticated to believe in God. And if I do, I just believe in some old supernatural deity, but I'm not going to say that he's Jesus. And I'm certainly not going to say that he's the God of the Bible, because that means I'm going to be accountable for my sin. Mr. You are miserable and you are empty, and you may have enough money to fill your life with toys and excitement to forget about God for a little bit, but you're always going to be, you're always going to be reeled back in to reality. And when you are, you're going to feel miserable and empty and that your life is meaningless, and you know it. That's the truth. Man was created to enjoy life with God, and if he doesn't, He's going to be unhappy. Verse 6. Yea, though he lives a thousand years twice over, yet he has seen no good. Do not all go to one place. And I'll warn again. I've, I've warned several times here in our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. Be careful not to build your theology from the book of Ecclesiastes without considering the viewpoint of the one who's doing the writing. God is not saying that everyone is going to the same place, meaning everyone is going to heaven, or even everyone is going to hell. He's saying from the viewpoint of people who exclude him, God, from their thinking or their life in general, everyone dies, and that's it. It's over. And in many cases, that's seen as a good thing. And that's the common end of all people from the perspective of those who live their life without God. Now, it's not true. Well, in a sense, it is in this physical world. That's the end. That's your end, and that's the end of all people. But there's much more after that. Verse 7. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. People have appetites, and when you think about it, they work so that they can try to satisfy those appetites. Really, that's why you get money, right? I mean, that's why you work, because you have appetites that you want to satisfy, and you know there's no other way of doing it. But no matter what they may do, they're never completely satisfied. I mean, you can eat a lot today, but you're going to be hungry again tomorrow. An even bigger problem, our souls can never be satisfied without a close walk with Christ. That appetite, that spiritual appetite, that whether you want to admit it or not is there, is not going to be satisfied unless you repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and get reconnected or get connected to your Creator. And that's the only way to do it. Verse 8, for what has the wise more than the fool? What has the poor who knows to walk before the living? Question. What advantage does a smart person have over a fool's, over a fool who is so incompetent that he barely gets by? So what's, what's the advantage over somebody like that? I'll look at verse 9. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and grasping after the wind. In other words, take hold of what you can enjoy right now and enjoy it the best that you can. Don't squander what you could be enjoying by always looking for or wishing for something better than what you have. You know, some people waste their life because they're constantly looking for something better than what they have. And so they don't enjoy the, the now that they have. Verse 10, whatever has been is named already. And it is known that this is man, 
neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. Fatalism. Fatalism is the logical result of a life without God. What will happen will happen. Everything is fixed and no one can change it, including God, because he's not even there. Or if he is, I don't care that he's here, so he's excluded out of my mind, so I don't even think in those terms. It's fatalism. What will be, will be. No one's driving. That's the logical outcome of somebody who excludes God from their life in one way or another. Verse 11. Since there are many things that increase vanity, how, how is man the better? If everything is useless in the long run, you're not any further ahead by doing more or having more. How could you be? Why put the effort into having more or doing more when in the long run you're no further ahead? Everything is still meaningless is what he is saying. He's just being honest as a man who is living his life without God. He's being honest. A lot of you are living your life without God, and you're putting on a, you're putting on a show. You're full of pretense because you try to make believe that your life is so fulfilled. It's not. And don't tell me that it is because I don't believe it. His attitude was, what's the use? Everything is useful, or useless, I should say. Nothing, nothing is worth anything if you reject Christ. That's what you want. You want to reject Christ? You want to live your life apart from God? That's what you want? Well, then that feeling of uselessness and meaningless, that comes with it. That's reality. Verse 12. For who knows what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life, which he spends like a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? In other words, who can say what is, best, what is the best way to live? And who can say what happens after we die? Well, if you don't accept the word of God, you, you probably feel that way. And a lot of people do. That's where situation ethics comes in. Who are you to tell me what's right? Who are you to tell me what's wrong? Who are you to tell me the, what is normal? I got my own system of beliefs. There is no objective truth. You see, you reject God, you reject Jesus, you reject his word, and that's what you're left us with, moral relativism. And that ends in, in, in a feeling of hopelessness and meaninglessness because it's not real. You're not going to get away with that. People say, we might as well live any way we want. Because who knows what's right and what's wrong? And who knows what will happen in eternity anyway? Well, how about letting Jesus tell us what will happen in eternity? He knows. You know why? Because he's created everything. In heaven and in earth Seen and unseen, physical realm, spiritual realm, he's created it all. Why don't you let him tell you what happens in eternity? You know what he says? Hell happens in eternity. Hell happens in eternity for those who don't repent and receive Christ. Burning, suffering, torment beyond comprehension that never ends happens in eternity to those who reject Christ. Now let's go into chapter 7. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. If you're a Christian, then the day of your death is actually better than the day of your birth. It really is. Now, if you're not a Christian, then you better prolong your pitiful life as long as you possibly can because the lake of fire is on the other side. Verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning 
than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Every house, your house, my house, if it hasn't already, will eventually become a house of mourning. Pathetic, ungodly, godless Solomon says, it's better to go to a funeral than a party because a funeral reminds us that life has a dead end and therefore in the end is meaningless. What a fun guy to be around. According to him, everything ends at death, so why care about anything? Let's just get it over with. Verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. Sorrow is better than laughter, if you're unsaved and are sad because this life is meaningless and there's nothing to look forward to after death. Sorrow is better than laughter. You know, at least someone like that is sort of living in reality. That's better than a giggling giddiness of an unsaved person who seeks to cover the serious side of life with useless laughter. I mean, that's really a waste. That's really living in non-reality. Verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. A senseless, contrived happiness that ignores reality is not good. That's not a good way to be. Be happy when you can, but don't ignore reality, because if you do, then you're going to be in trouble when it catches up to you, and it will eventually catch up to you. Verse 5, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Listening to someone who corrects you by the word of God is time better spent than listening to some immoral and irresponsible person talk foolish. Oh, they'll make you feel comfortable for the moment by helping you to escape reality in your mind, at least for now, but it's going to catch up with you sooner or later and that is going to really be bad because you didn't take it seriously enough to prepare for it. Verse 6. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Thorns make poor firewood for cooking. Back in those days, it did really poor. They burned really fast and they burned really hot but they didn't burn long enough to cook what was in the pot. So they just gave a quick, hot heat, and that was it. And God says the laughter of fools is like those burning thorns. A lot of noise, crackle, doesn't accomplish anything. And just like the thorns, the fools are being consumed, even as they laughed, even as they laugh senselessly. Makes no sense. It's all a big waste. It's all a big joke. Bad joke. Verse 7. Surely oppression makes a wise man mad, and a bribe destroys the heart. It is bad to be abused. It is even worse to be the abuser, believe it or not. In the long run, that's true. If a person extorts or takes a bribe to pervert justice, they may hurt others. They may make life unpleasant for others. But they are doing greater damage to their own soul and their own mind and their own character than they are to others. Let's stop right there for today. I think we've, I think we've gone far enough. Um... Just a reminder that you can study the entire Bible online at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com, the scripture verse-by-verse -verse website 
found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study every single verse of the Bible from Genesis through Revelation twice. It's going to take you a while to get through it because it is verse by verse. It's not book by book or chapter by chapter. But why don't you begin today to study the Word of God with me? It'll bless you because it's the Word of God. Again, it's the thebibleversebyverse.com. Now, if the Word of God blesses you, would you please consider blessing us back? Because your prayers and your financial support are greatly appreciated. It's your prayers and financial support that keeps this ministry going because I'm not underwritten by a large church or a large denomination. This is strictly a faith ministry and has been for 30 years. I depend on the prayers and the financial support of those who are fed the Word of God and blessed by it. And if you want to give, you can at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the uh, donate button on the front page and give in a very secure method using PayPal. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And also, if you want to get in touch with us the old-fashioned way, our mailing address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Until next time, this is Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. I appreciate you spending this time with me. I always love teaching the Word of God. I always love being in the Word. Nothing better on earth than the Word of God. I'll see you next time. Until then, so long, everyone.